What's up, Stats? Hi, Jonah. Welcome to the Therapist Thrival Guide. My name is Miranda Barker. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I am joined with my co-host, Dr. Lucas Bellini. Hello. No, nothing to add this time? Um, I, I work in franchising. <laughs> <laughs> and we interrupt our regularly scheduled programming because we have something really exciting to talk about today, something that's been in the news, something that we hear a lot about right now. That we wanted to I believe trending. Yes, trending is the word. Trending, exactly. Stuts. <laughs> Stuts, exactly. And we are joined today with Dr. Terry Bly. I'm sandwiched between doctors today. It's kind of fun. Um, and Dr. Bly, Dr. Terry Bly, is going to join this conversation. She has a new podcast coming out through Ellie in January 2023. So get ready for that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that too, I'm sure. But we wanted her to come on here and and talk a little bit about Stutz. So do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, Terry? Sure. Um, I'm Terry Bly. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist here at Ellie. I've been doing this for a while. Um, been at Ellie for five years. And uh, yeah. And then I have kind of a weird obsession with television um, and theater and acting. I have a, psych- a theater degree which probably plays into that. So, yeah, and I like finding where the two intersect. Yeah. Theater, theater, film, TV, and psychology, those those things. Yeah, I love that. Which is what found you a home at Ellie Creative. Yes, this is where where it all comes together. So not only only having, you know, your own featured podcast where you'll dig into the psychology and relationships of TV shows, um, but also your engagement with the Be Welly app and just a ton of our psychoeducational content. Yeah. So the intersection of your knowledge and your ability to not only perform, but help us learn how to perform has been a lot of fun to see that come to life at your Thanks. day job. It's so, kind of amazing that there's a way for it all to come yeah. together. Icky yeah. guy. Icky guy. Icky That's guy. Right. Something exactly. I don't think I told you guys, quick story. Yeah. Um, right before I reached out to you guys, I was talking to my own therapist and was talking about like theater. I want to do theater. I'm missing the creative stuff. And then I've got, but I love doing therapy. And how do I make these work? Because I'm mm. also a parent and mm-hmm. a wife and all of that. And she's like, I know you can find a way to bring these together. I love that. So there's got to be a way for you to bring the theater creative stuff and the therapy stuff. You just got to like find it. Mm-hmm. And then I learned about LA Creative and I was like, well, there it is. Wow. I just need to figure out how to that is so cool. how that to insert myself story. into it. And so, yes, very That's exciting perfect. and excited therapy session after that when I ran into her office and I was like, yeah. I did it. I found it. And right down the hall. Yes. you opposite just... ends of the building, but. No, she's saying she, to... she ran, ran into her therapist. therapist's office. No, I know, yeah. but like but you then found, I found this it. right oh, here. Same yeah. building. Right, yeah, right down the hall. Um, <laughs> Didn't really even have to switch jobs. It was just right at the other end of the building. Yeah. So mark my words, even though this might be your first time hearing about and hearing Dr. Terry Bly's voice, this is not going to be the last time. She is going to show up in your podcast app soon and in the Be Welly app very, very soon, too. So, Lucas, actually, let me just let me just start this episode by saying I heard about the Stutz documentary is are we calling it a documentary it's a movie it's a film yeah it's a film Mm -hmm. i heard i heard about the film um a couple weeks ago you came up to me and you were and the other members of our creative team and you were like oh my gosh i just watched an incredible film like blew my mind this was so good and then we started talking about this more and more and i'm realizing that the three of us all kind of have slightly different reactions Mm. feedback views about this this film and so i'm really excited to dive into it um but lucas do you want to start by saying like what is this film and what drew you to it well what drew me to it was it was just a film about a therapist that's pretty much all i knew jonah hill made a film about his therapist and so i was immediately interested and eager to watch it um and I I loved it. I laughed. I cried. And it was a lot of things that I didn't expect. You know, it was essentially what Jonah Hill knew was that he wanted to make a movie about his therapist because he believed in the work he was doing. You know, he had a lot of 
former experiences in therapy that weren't helpful. You know, and Phil's method being very unique and distinct is kind of what got him to where he was trying to go. But it's also like a, it's not just a movie about Stutz. It's a movie about Jonah Hill trying to make this movie, which was mm-hmm. another super interesting layer. Very meta. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so that was something that, you know, I was already engaged. Um, when that dimension was added to it, it just became that much more interesting, especially, you know, with, and that's why I brought it to the creative team, because it's also, it's like we're always talking about compelling ways to tell stories, mm-hmm. you know, and to tell narratives. And and this was one that I had never really seen before. Um, but I would say what the movie ultimately ended up being about was their therapeutic relationship. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I don't think that's what Jonah set out to do. Mm-mm. I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Um, he wanted it to just be about stuff. Yeah, like just that about stuff. At least that's what he said in the yep. documentary. This is about you. This isn't a... And he kept trying yeah. to like force it back yeah. there and mm-hmm. Phil was not interested. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because I think, I'm sure Phil knew that's what it was ultimately about. Uh, and I don't know where jo- Jonah might be, you know, with that now. But I just thought it was absolutely beautiful. Mm. I think it shows a dimension of therapy that's been largely invisible to the public Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know as far as like this is also what therapy can be like therapy can be so many things uh but what it ultimately is is a reflection of the person that you're seeing for therapy um and yeah so i mean i i've been i'm I'm in love do you think that you are similar to phil stutz in your method of therapy yeah Yeah. i think that's why you were so drawn to it too yeah not just yeah, like I did, yeah, like he does strange therapy. I do sh- strange therapy, I guess. <laughs> or like I would say I do things in therapy that things people have observed, like especially when I was working in a day treatment program and everything just happens in the milieu. Yeah. Um, or like when I would talk about things I've done, a lot of it will give people like a, an initial response of like, oh my gosh, it's like hmm. you can't, you did that? Like what are you talking about? Um... I don't know, like, I d- it does bring me back to day treatment primarily. Um, you know, like working with the students to organize a mutiny against the special education teachers <laughs> who are improperly <laughs> teaching history. Hmm. And like barricading ourselves in the room and blasting Pink Floyd. <laughs> what? That was just, that was a therapeutic intervention. Sure. At day treatment. Okay. Okay. Um, that I'm assuming you came up with spontaneously Uh, yeah yeah um and i think that's a lot of what phil is like he's very disinhibited i would say that like i would say i'm a Mm -hmm. very disinhibited Mm -hmm. therapist that kind of shoots from the hip is what i'm hearing yeah Yeah. like i I trust my impulses sure um you know and so at first it's like oh my gosh like why'd you do that it's like did you really do that like and then sometimes it extends to like you can't do that but when you really (laughs) just kind of sit and think about it and realize the effect that it had it's like there's nothing problematic about it at all. Mm-hmm. It was just something that was huh. effective. I think I'll want to return to that idea as yeah. we're kind I'll, of breaking I'll, I'll this down. I'll throw them out as they uh, as they come to me. Yeah. for more examples too. No, I think that I think what you exactly what you just said I think is we'll probably keep talking about that because it is it is an interesting way of doing therapy and I think that um, I'm interested to hear about your perspective, Terry, because I think that. Um, I think you and I are probably a little bit more closely aligned in our reactions with the yeah. with the film. And so do you want to tell us a little bit about what your thoughts were? Yeah. I mean, and I, before you jump in, yeah. Phil, I have established Phil as my grandfather. Okay. So be respectful. Totally. Okay. I'll, I'll be respectful and also. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I may not agree with you on everything. Oh, sure. But, uh, my grandfather is imperfect. I okay. Cool. Um, so I actually came, I, it's funny, this all coincided. I, it was my husband who showed me the preview and I hadn't, whatever meeting this came up, I wasn't there. And so I hadn't heard of it. And so my husband sent it to me. And so then I sent it to you guys and mm-hmm. I was like, we should do something mm-hmm. with this, right? That's right. Yes. Um, and so we watched it this week and, um, yeah. So am I talking about like my reactions yeah. now or, um, yeah. so I also, have you heard of couples therapy on Showtime? No. So have you watched that at all? Mm-hmm. So I'm, 
I will start by saying I think I'm more of a Dr. Orna. I can't remember her last name, but like my style is probably more like hers. So watching this, she's cool. She, I, she's I, bold. Like she's that's who I want to adopt. She trusts like herself. My, yeah, yeah, she's yeah. amazing. Um, so watching him was interesting because there were times when my husband would pause it and he would say, "Fine, just take a moment, gloat, say I say this all the time." Like when he started out, you know, when he starts out talking about like, you've got to take care of your body. Mm -hmm. Like it's all about that. Mm -hmm. And then there are a couple other things that my husband would be like, yep, there, there it is. <laughs> and so for, on some level, I really resonated with and I liked I, I like that honesty. I tend to take a more forthright um, approach. And like with some of my clients, I am very I kind of that salty, irreverent kind of thing. And. There were some times when, and as I scribbled furiously in my notes, there were times when I would pause and I would say, yeah, I don't know about that. Uh -huh. Or straight up like, no, nope, nope. I just, as a therapist, I, I have to disagree with with even just saying those words in any context. I don't care if this is just a documentary or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I, I had certain things that I'm already incorporating into my sessions that I, I learned from how he would talk about these concepts. And there were some places where I guess I disagreed and took away with from it with like, as therapists, we can't just copy someone else. Like he's got his oh, style yeah. and it obviously works for him. He's not sitting around without clients, right? Mm -hmm. And then, but for some of us, whether it's gender or race or personality or whatever, it's not going to work or just where we live in the country. I suspect... I think is he in New York or LA? Probably LA. Okay. Um, in in a place like New York or LA, I bet you can get away with things that you can't necessarily get away with in the Midwest, sure, or the South, or like I think there are different things. Or if you're, I do think if you're a man, you can get away with a different style than if you're a woman because of people's expectations of what you're going to be like. So I do think there are there's enough that I saw from him that. I wanted to adopt, and there was plenty that I thought, yeah, that's just not, I just don't think that's workable. Hmm. Maybe maybe just for me, but also I think I would never tell other, especially new therapists, um, to do this stuff. I also wrote in my notes, last comment here, and then I'll shut up here for a bit. Last comment was, I think what we're seeing with him is some of the things that he does, I think you can do this after you've been a therapist for so long. Yeah. That it is clearly just who you are and where you have arrived as a therapist that probably he, even he couldn't do when he was a new therapist. It wouldn't have worked when he was a baby therapist. And it works now because of his age and his experience and, the, you know, the other things that he has to offer, I think, is also important to point out. Absolutely. No, I totally agree. I think that there were times during the – during the film where I was thinking to myself, this guy is, I don't think my mind was blown as much as some people's were as they were watching this. I think that a lot of his tools seemed familiar and, um, and so I wasn't like blown away by him, but I was pretty shocked about how he talks about things. And mm -hmm. I mean, even just some of the comments that he made kind of would have rubbed me the wrong way at times, but, um, I think that that you can kind of at the very end of the film Jonah makes a comment about how like he's so used to putting people on pedestals or like people mm -hmm. who are in authority above him and thinking like they've got it all together and they they don't go through the sort of suffering that he's been through and that struck me because I think it it helped me view the film a little bit differently because it made me realize that so much of this film is about humanizing therapists mm -hmm. too. Yes. So then that made me like the film more because mm -hmm. of that interaction where Phil laughs and he's like, well, I've mm -hmm. been like, you know, we both lost our brothers. We have these different things that we both have gone through. And so because of that inter interaction, I think that it made me kind of, it made me think about the film differently and made me realize like um, it is important for clients to see that therapists don't have it all together and that they are human and they and and how beautiful when a therapist can be their authentic self and and show up exactly how they are yeah. and you know make crude jokes if that's the type of therapist they are but 
Um, we can talk about that <laughs> at some point too, but, um, but I thought it was, it was nice and it was heartwarming, but, um, not something that I was like, I am buying all of his books and immediately incorporating these things in my practice mm -hmm. because I don't think that, um, I don't think that I'm that type of therapist. I think that we just have very different styles and personalities. However, I did finish it and go, wow, I feel like I just sat in on one of Dr. Lucas Fellini's therapy sessions. You know, like that's, the, that's kind of the, that's the type of therapist I imagine mm -hmm. you are. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was, it's been fun to talk to yeah. you about and I, I this. did buy, I did buy his book. Yes, you did. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I already love it. Can I see it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, a couple of things to keep in mind, like what I appreciate of the many things I appreciate about uh, Stutz and kind of what he portrayed in this uh, film is that it's, he is just himself. Like he's figured mm -hmm. out a way to just fully be mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. in his therapist. Like self and therapist have integrated mm -hmm. and have become one. And, and so when I say that, it's like Phil is being Phil. So it's not a matter of like replicating what he does or kind of like pretending, you know, to be as abrupt, you know, and unfiltered mm -hmm. as he right. is because you think it'll be therape therapeutically effective. It's like be those things in therapy if that's who you are. Mm -hmm. If that's how you operate and that's how you engage with people on a on a general basis, um, then, then yeah, it's like we all have to figure out a way to bring that into our therapy. And it, he does, you know, I'd put him in the camp of uh, Carl Whitaker. You know, I think like there are a lot mm -hmm. of parallels there. Uh, Whitaker's right behind your head. He's my godfather. Um, and Whitaker would talk about how, because he was super disinhibited, like the things mm -hmm. he was doing in family therapy were absolutely yeah. absurd. And that's why his therapy was labeled therapy of the absurd. Um, and you know, students would come up to him at UW-Madison, be like, Dr. Whitaker, I love what you're doing. You know, like, I want to practice like you. Uh, I want to, you know, help families heal, you know, and strengthen relationships. And he'd say every time, he'd be like, that's great. You know, it's like, go to med school. It's like, read all the books that they have you read there. It's like, read some more books on top of that. After you graduate, you know, come back to see me and I'll help you figure out how to unlearn all of those things <laughs> and learn how to be yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, and so Whitaker's role, and that's why his model is also so difficult to write about in a textbook, because the only method that it had was whatever method each individual needs to figure out who they are and, and how to integrate that. And like, that's what Stutz is. You know, and even, you know, when we, like his, what we saw was his very distinct relationship with Jonah Hill, mm -hmm. you know? And so I had, I imagine there are parts of him that come to life more in that therapeutic relationship that don't come out in some of his other therapeutic relationships, sure. you know? So like there's, I'm ultimately guided by an integrated framework in all of my therapy, but there are subtle distinctions and kind of how I show up mm -hmm. uh, at the level of the therapeutic relationship. So what you're saying is that Stutz does not make jokes about banging his all of his clients' moms. I would imagine he doesn't. <laughs> no, like I would like that's not an intervention. <laughs> yeah. to say that. not an intervention. You know, that's something that right. spontaneously came out because mm -hmm. it was allowed within the mm -hmm. rules mm -hmm. that came to life that governed his relationship with Jonah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it made me cringe so much yeah, when he same. said that. And Super then his cringed. mom came like, on the, yep. oh my it goodness. Just, that's like yeah. the first, That's the that was the first time in my life where I had the reaction to somebody doing something in therapy that people generally have to me. <laughs> oh, no. So like, mm -hmm. I, I did have a moment of like, whoa. Yeah. That was, that was a the line only I have never crossed. Yeah, I was gonna say that's like, I have, other areas where he was doing stuff, I thought, I don't know. This is an interesting one. I don't know if I would recommend doing this. <laughs> that was the one where I was like, no, just don't. Well, like if then, I was talking to other therapists, I would just say, just don't. Like, no. I think you can do great therapy and connect with somebody without making any jokes about having sex with their parents. You know, I just and think I that's probably agreed. a and safe I, bet. I think that if Phil Stutz was in the room, he would probably be like, yeah, that was probably crossing the line because I, of the way Jonah Hill oh, yeah. responded. No, he was not crossing the line. He well, would not. He would, uh, see, but see, I'm then he was, he was you. embarrassed. Yeah. Like he was, Phil was embarrassed. Phil yeah. was embarrassed. Yeah. 
by what yeah. he said. And then, and then, That's not Phil. but then Jonah Hill brought it up to his mom. Yeah. yeah. I just was like, oh my word. I was, I was watching this, the, that particular scene last night as I was making enchiladas mm. and I just like nearly dropped the wooden spoon on the floor because I was like, yeah. oh no. <laughs> oh my God. That was effective. Like that <laughs> was one of those things where I would say it, it was effective. And in it was what fine. Way? I just think well, I'm I think with in Miranda a lot of ways. This. One, I, I don't know. one, I don't one, Jonah so. Hill responded to that. Like he loved it. He I thought know. it was hilarious. It strengthened the therapeutic relationship in that moment. But there's the other, so many other ways you can. Oh yeah, it's there are, there are Brazilian, but that's the one that just happened to yeah. come out spontaneously because that's kind of how he operates. And I would, yeah, I would guarantee you. I think you, you've got to have a, say that some kind client. of filter, though. And I don't know. To me, yeah. that one is well. There's still a filter there. There are far worse things he could have said. Like that's not the <laughs> that's not the final line. I don't like, know. Maybe like stepped over line, but there's still you know. could go. He could go much, 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 much. See, further. I I just don't think there's any ever. I don't think there's ever, and a, a a reason to say something like that. But I think we what, can what agree ethical to code does it violate? What? <laughs> I don't know. I don't. None. It doesn't, uh, it's not unethical. But is it about it or is it about, it could do harm to a therapeutic relationship though. Oh yeah, but it didn't, it strengthened it. Sure, but do you don't, like, it, I think other, there are plenty of other things that could strengthen the therapeutic relationship that don't have to involve making jokes about banging someone's mother. I just, just don't think. Well, you know, maybe, maybe there, yeah. maybe there's a dynamic here of like, of course, Maybe, like the factor of we're disagreeing on the appropriateness of talking about fucking someone's mom. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I'm a man, and you're two moms. Yeah, and we're, you know? we're two moms. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, that one's not going to get reconciled. Yeah. That's, That's what I'm saying. We might point. have to agree to disagree. But I, would, I would say the point is, is like, yeah, like, none of this is everyone's cup of tea. There's yeah. no such thing. I'm not as feeling cup ambivalence about this yeah. one. I'm feeling yeah. really solid and, and comfortable <laughs> in my <laughs> my stance on it. The one thing though that I I did want to. Add, Ask, get your guys' take on because I think this this documentary raises two, I think, more universal questions. And you know, we talk about when you learn, you know, and we're in school and we're learning about the different interventions and different schools of thought around therapy. I think this brought up two really poignant ones that is constant are constantly in flux. One is how much of ourselves as therapists do we reveal? Yes, in session. Yeah, there's so much controversy. Like if if um. I think I'll just be, I think I'll just be open about some of the stuff I've got. Like my first husband died of suicide. I get clients who come in and they've been affected by suicide and that's what brings them to therapy. And every time I'm like, is that a, like, do I bring up my mm -hmm. experience or is that making it about me? How much do I insert? Like, when are you connecting with somebody around a common thing and letting them know that like, I'm not just a neutral person. I am a human who's been through pain and and all of that and when are you inserting yourself into their experience um and risk making it about you somehow like i think just how much of yourself do you bring into the session when do you bring it into the session because i think because this was a documentary he told us a lot about himself mm -hmm. jonah was asking kind of switching roles there quite yeah. a bit and I'm going to assume that's not a typical therapy thing that he does. But if he does do this, if this is just how he is with his clients, I'm curious what you guys think about that. And then, well, I'll just I'll just stick with that one. I think that's that was something that I was really struck by when I was watching the the show because I that's I think similarly I I do kind of wonder okay when do I share certain things about my life. Um, I've I've talked about this on the on this podcast before, but I am a mom through adoption, and I see a lot of um, birth parents and adoptees in therapy, and that the fact that I'm an adoptive mom adds like a a very it can it can be a complicated layer, mm -hmm. um, and so the I think similarly like I I. I question myself a lot about like at what point do I share these things I mean there's a picture mm -hmm. of of me and my daughter in my office it's a mm -hmm. transracial adoption we do not look alike <laughs> and so yeah. um that's one of those things where uh I think that I struggle as a therapist kind of knowing you know what the line is and that line is different with every client yeah. but when well, I was taught in graduate school not to have pictures of family oh interesting in, in my office like oh. it was you just oh, yeah, don't psychologists are yeah we I mean, was just, that was just a no-no. Argue about whether or not we should tell clients how old we are. Yeah, 
Really? I mean, I was very much school of like, you don't tell anything about yourself. Hmm. You don't put pictures of your family. Mm -hmm. You don't like, you just don't talk about yourself at all. Unless, except when we learned about feminist therapy, that was the one kind of approach to therapy where you kind of like tiptoe into the idea Hmm. of like, being more of a human. But all the other schools of therapy that we learned about, it was very much like you are there to be a blank, to be projected upon. You know, if you're talking about yourself, they can't project, they can't do the transference thing, Mm -hmm. right? Because you're you're like preventing the transference Mm -hmm. from happening by inserting who you really are into Mm -hmm. the process, right? And so... And then MFTs were just like, Let's just bring their mom in <laughs> so they don't have to transfer her onto us. <laughs> right. Right. I like it. But That's interesting. Yeah. So going back to your question, that was something that I kept questioning while I was watching that movie mm-hmm. of like, surely he doesn't share every, all of this with most clients. But I also um, – It is it, now. Yeah, That's true. That's true. Yeah. And so it is kind of this this question of like how much do you share and and does it depend on, you know – I'm sure, it, of course, it depends on the client. And then, uh, although it, there was one comment that Jonah made during the film where he said, I didn't know that you lost your brother until we were doing this film. Mm-hmm. And so I think mm-hmm. there, I think there was some, some, a lot of that that came out during, during the making the of making, it. Yeah. However, um, that seemed to be a healing aspect for Jonah, mm-hmm. though, to find out that his therapist has been through something similar. And again, this film kind of is is meta because it's a film about filming the film. And so, <laughs> um, and so you got to see how powerful some of that personal information was for yeah. Jonah to find. And so that was a, I don't have the answer for that, yeah, but it well, was a like, challenge. This for me. wasn't the film shouldn't be looked at as. Phil actually doing a therapy session with Jonah Hill. Yes. You know, like it, it, Good that, point. That was the initial approach, you know, when Jonah started making it until he realized that it needed to be something bigger and mm-hmm, different. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like I I wouldn't get too caught up in that piece uh, at like the actual clinical level because that was interesting that they had worked together for years and he had no idea. Yeah. Um, so it's like he's obviously intentional. He's being intentional with his self-disclosure. Mm-hmm. But I think that topic is almost like the layer beneath that that I really took away from this film and I've been thinking probably the most about since watching it is um, like the notion of loving your clients. Mm -hmm. Yes, I definitely noticed that too. You know, and like, and when we talk about the therapeutic relationship, it's like, should love be Mm -hmm. a component of that? Mm Mm-hmm. And if so, like how and when, you know, it's like, yeah, we don't know anything about love. Mm. Nobody defines love. Love isn't even yeah. acknowledged in marriage and family therapy textbooks. Well, and then if the idea of therapy is for them to eventually not need you anymore, mm-hmm. then that also raises that question of if, if there's love there, though, then does that demotivate you to want to let them go, for them to want to let you it go. It certainly complicates yeah. the termination process. Yeah. Like, I bet Phil sees all of his clients for years. Years and years, yeah. Like, he's I, not a short-term therapist. No. no. Neither am I. That's true. I no. I'm guessing he also doesn't bill insurance. <laughs> yeah, that's, I kept thinking, no. what insurance yeah. is Jonah Hill on? <laughs> With their reimbursement rates in L.A. County. Yeah. Uh, I think that I might have a slightly different view of this, though, because I see mostly kids – and mm. like adolescence. And mm. I think that for adults, they go into therapy and they go into that relationship knowing it's going to end and like viewing this person as a professional. Whereas like for kids, when they go into this relationship, they, it's just, it's different for them. Mm-hmm. Like they, they sure they know I'm a therapist and like we talk about what that means, but I think that they grow attached to me just in a different way than I think adult clients yeah. would. And like a teacher, like a really yeah, meaningful, yeah. impactful teacher that they would have. Right. And so I think that that notion, I'm, I'm so interested that you brought that up, Lucas, because I didn't, that didn't even strike me in this mm. film because I, like, I think that I truly love most of my clients mm, yeah. and it's just a different kind of attachment than. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's its own brand of love. Yeah. You yeah. Know, oh, but definitely. It's love. Mm-hmm. 
you know, and it's, I thought it, I just thought it was so beautiful how openly they shared that with one another, especially yeah. being two men, mm -hmm. you know, two men doing the therapy thing together, saying, I love you at the end. Well, and I'm reminded by one of my good friends, um, he, last year he was sworn in as a judge and he was talking in his like swearing in ceremony about how one thing that he's learned from the people that were in that room was just how much he he loves them and how he wishes that he said I love you more mm -hmm. and um I think about that a lot because I I have started saying I love you to my friends so much more because of of like that example that he set because I think it's important to tell people that you love them and to say to not shy away from that and I think that is a really good example in that in the film if so a thought that just popped up that I'm just going to put out there though is that I think if we're talking about love therapist client client to therapist though there's also a question client can't love you if they like really like if, if they don't know you mm -hmm. right so if you're if you're just this kind of neutral oh, or whatever yeah. or hmm. you're not telling anything about yourself then what what are they where's what's the they're like loving the, the relationship the love? yeah sure. i think because if we were talking about any relationship outside of therapy if it was love going back and forth there'd be an assumption that you're you've each kind of revealed yourselves hmm. to each yeah. other i would so as as we've been talking i feel like i've kind of like organized like what how i would describe the ther the brand of therapeutic relationship that I build with clients and it's it's like they know me mm -hmm. they know and the clients I work with over the span of years it's like they come to know me very well at the level of like how I operate and exist in the world like how I'm yeah. present mm -hmm. you know and so like if we if I were to go socialize with them you know or meet them for dinner d it, hypothetically I would show up to that dinner in the exact same way yeah. that I would ha that I showed up to every therapy session. Mm -hmm. And so like at the experiential level, it's like they come to know you, the difference and we come to know them very well at the experiential level. The difference is we learn about all the little details of their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's like my clients know me, mm -hmm. but there are so many things that they don't know yeah, about, about me. You. Yeah. So that was going to be one of my questions for you Lucas was like how much do you share with your clients about your life or like self-disclosure so when it comes to because it's like you also need to give clients some of that you know mm -hmm. to nurture it's almost like fertilizer for the uh for the therapeutic relationship um but it's like if you over, which again if some you over, schools of therapy say no you never yeah do, some schools yeah. Play, yeah you know and if you over fertilize something it's going to burn right. and mm -hmm. die um yeah. and so when it comes to like the selective self-disclosures of the things about my life and me, uh, it, it just needs to go through the filter of checking the boxes of will this benefit mm -hmm. the therapeutic relationship and will this benefit progress toward reaching therapeutic goals, you know, or play a, play, mm -hmm. play a part in that. And unless it, unless it checks both those boxes, I don't say it or yeah. share it. Sometimes I found, so to be like, I, I probably, I, I wrestle with this all the time because my instinct is to not be super closed off. Like, so my, you know, my therapist, a lot of them, my clients know my kids' names, you know, or they, they know yeah. that I have kids yeah. and they know their names. Um, and then sometimes, like during the pandemic, um, a number of my clients knew that my dad was dying because suddenly I was at my dad's house. And for a couple of them, I would have to pause the session because my dad had fallen down and I had mm. to like, and the, you yeah. know, so there were some things that just, mm -hmm. just out of necessity, they had to know. Um, but it's something I wrestle with all the time. Like I, it's a constant push and pull because, like I said, my training was really around mm. revealing nearly nothing. My personality is very open. As like as a person, I'm not a closed off. Keep you know cards close to my chest kind of a person and so figuring out who my authentic self is is has, as a therapist has always been this tension between those two things I don't want mm -hmm. to insert myself I've been I know when I first started here I had a couple of therapists or clients who fired me because they just felt like I wasn't holding that line very well and I probably wasn't um when I first started here again um because I'd taken a pause from doing therapy and so I was still kind of getting my 
my legs and my boundaries mm-hmm. just like under me. Um, but it's just this, to me, it's just this, this constant tension of being my authentic self, not inserting myself into the session, not ever making it about me, right. but also wanting them to know that I'm a human. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, I feel like a lot of this show towards the end, especially, it was really about like, you know, when, when, when Stutz was talking about his relationship with women and I was really struck by like, here he is acknowledging that he has the same hangups that he sits with his clients and has all these tools to help them work through. Mm -hmm. And yet he hasn't had a long-term like committed relationship, Mm -hmm. you know, like he's got his things. And I think I, I often tell my clients, like being a psychologist one of the most frustrating things has been how little it helps me in, as a parent. Like I'm supposed to know <laughs> behavior, right? Like we study behavioral psychology and I felt like it was just, I study parenting, all that has not helped me very much as a parent. I feel like it's just put like a little me up in the corner mm-hmm. saying, what are you doing? You know better than to do that. <laughs> Why are you yelling at your kids? You know, that's not going to help them mm-hmm. anyway. So yeah. So I guess that that's where I struggle is just, and so seeing him be so transparent, I oh. almost felt like, damn it, but I don't, I don't want to see this because I, I don't need any encouragement <laughs> to mm. talk more about myself in session. It's like you can absolutely be an effective therapist while still carrying some unresolved shit. You know, oh, that absolutely. You, you have figured to. figured out for yourself. That's um, a good point. Because we ha- we're all going to have unresolved yeah. shit. Mm-hmm. And I do think that's important yeah. for people to know. We I, don't have all our shit together. Yeah. And I think for Phil... Stuff. You know, and what he disclosed about his upbringing, you know, after his brother died, he became the parent to mm-hmm. his parents and his yeah. entire family. Yeah. And so his entire life was organized around loving other people mm-hmm. and giving love and taking care of other people taking care with, of, yeah. uh, with little to no experiences of learning how to be loved and to be mm-hmm. taken care of by mm-hmm. others. You know, so it's like, makes sense. He went into psychiatry, um, also makes sense. You know that 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 shows up in in relationships, um, and you know it's it's I, I didn't mean to go you know deep diving into into his life, but it's like we need to we need to sustain a degree of like psychological health as a therapist. Um, but yeah, it's like our we're always gonna have shit mm-hmm. that's unresolved that we need to work through. Um, but I do believe that Phil probably very likely applies a lot of his tools and his teachings uh in in his personal life and that's i would say that's another a similarity that spoke to me in that film was how much like my approach to therapy is almost a direct reflection of like my epistemological understanding of the world we're living in you know like it's it's Mm -hmm. it's an integrated like world view of these ultimate truths you know because like a lot of like you said it's like phil didn't make up all of these terms and concepts Mm -hmm. but he did borrow them from different disciplines you know and integrated them in a way where he turned them into applicable tools you know that had a therapeutic purpose to it um but yeah like the 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 universal truths of uncertainty just mm-hmm. being a given that we all have to deal with what were they pain yeah pain like suffering mm-hmm. it was it was pain uncertainty, that you're gonna have to work uh, and you're gonna have and to work, work. And, yeah. constant work and i think those that those three in and of itself you know so like pain that's buddhism that's eastern philosophy um uncertainty is a lot of existentialism um you know constant work you know that's existentialism talks about that relative to freedom um, i was gonna say capitalism and human, <laughs> yeah but i mean i think a lot of those are things that people have to i'm convinced at least that until we come to accept those as realities everything else is going to fail mm-hmm. because if we haven't accept if we have not accepted those as realities then we're operating through a distorted lens of an like idealized depiction of ultimate mental health where all those things go away yeah. mm-hmm. you know and it's like one of the first things that i need to assess for to see where my clients are at with this because we need to get on the same page with it is mental health is not a finish line Mm -hmm. Um, and mental health does not mean you live with a complete absence of like stress and pain Pain. and that you won't suffer anymore or that your inner critic goes away or what he calls yeah part x part x X. like it doesn't go away no it'll never go away isn't about figuring Mm -hmm. out how to get rid of that voice Mm -hmm. yeah 
And it's like we and once we get to it's like it's about learning how to live with them, Mm -hmm. you know, as productively as we can. And knowing that when we do get to a place where our mental health is pretty balanced, that doesn't mean our job is done. It's like just like Mm -hmm. physical exercise. You can train to run a marathon and you can complete that marathon. But that doesn't mean you're going to be able to run a marathon at any point in your life again whenever you want to. Mm -hmm. It's like you need to sustain that shape and that point of fitness that you got yourself to. And so, like, I love how his integration of those concepts, I could see how relevant they are to therapy um, because unless, yeah, unless those those realities are accepted, I I would say therapy will largely be a waste of time. And it's just a therapist perpetuating that false belief that we can ultimately escape suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's been, I was just having a conversation with a client earlier today that. And I think she was getting frustrated with me and maybe a little vice versa is because I was trying to explain that that concept of like you're not – the work doesn't go away. Yeah. And it is exhausting and it is hard. And and you can't – like, yes, medication can help, but, but the, we have to learn how to, how to sit with the suffering rather than just fight it. If we mm-hmm. fight the pain, if we fight the things that are hard and we, and we just try to like, oh, I want to get – you know – we're not going to be, we're not going to get measurably, sustainably better or, or happy in our lives or more comfortable with our lives because that that just can't be the goal is to stop feeling pain or to keep fighting pain. We have to learn how to tolerate it yeah. and keep moving forward even with that pain. I mean, that's grief too, yep. right? Like grief mm-hmm. isn't about getting over the loss of someone. Yep. It's how do you integrate it, tolerate that pain and still be you and still move forward and still make meaning in your life. And I think if we talk less about ha- less about happiness and more about meaning and purpose, yeah. I think that does a better job of incorporating the pain. Mm. I think when we think happy, we think pain free. And so I kind of wish we would stop talking about like, so we, I just want to be happy. OK, well, what else? Like, yeah. Sometimes you'll be happy. And Most like, of the time, you probably won't. And then what happens so. when, like, like ha- <laughs> happiness? I think it's the most fleeting emotion there it is. It is. That's what it's like means. Happy, Sometimes happiness, you'll be happy. But... Happiness exists yeah. right up until the moment that you become consciously aware of the fact that you're happy. Yeah. And it's like, then it's <laughs> right. done. Yes. Then it's already over. Now you're something else. Um, so, yeah, it's like, yeah, that's, a, that's a horrible goal to yeah. pursue. It's like perpetual happiness. Well, that, again, there's Sounds that that, impli- like that implicit piece of like, if I'm happy, I'm not in pain or yeah. I'm done with pain. Yeah. I'm just, I just want to be happy with my life. And okay. we're obsessed with that. Like yes, our, our culture and society is so fixated on escaping pain mm-hmm. and transcending pain. Like we don't want to be uncomfortable. We think we shouldn't have to ever be uncomfortable. Well, what do doctors tell you when you have surgery or when you have an injury? Like when they give you pain meds, yeah. you want to get ahead of the pain. Yeah. Like they make you afraid of pain if you're having a surgery. I've heard that so many times. I've had a number of surgeries. And every time they're like, take this before you experience pain. You want to get ahead of the pain. And I finally one time said, why, why do I need to get ahead of pain? I don't understand what's wrong with pain. Mm-hmm. And they couldn't really answer me. And so I was like, I'm, I'm just going to be fine with the pain. I don't, I don't want to take these. And they were all worried about that. And I just think that speaks to this, like, yeah. somehow pain is something to be avoided. Fear of it's discomfort. Yeah, yeah, it is a fear of discomfort. And, like, when we're, we're, we become that resistant to discomfort, it's like we start to resist. We resist it emotionally, too. Like, it's not just physical pain. It's emotional pain. We get afraid of it. Yeah. And we're we think something's wrong. We're afraid to be uncomfortable. You know, like, everything's mm-hmm. a threat. Yeah. You know, because you have no tolerance for it. So that's why I'm, I may... I'm about eight years in now to a daily practice of freezing cold showers. Yeah. And the reason I started doing it was um, uh, this was, I think, Teak, not uh, this came out of Buddhist readings. Um, I forget what specific source, but they identified how our tolerance for discomfort functions as a muscle. And the more you exercise it, the more you can use that muscle, like across you know, mm-hmm. all the different opportunities to, to use it. And so when you intentionally expose yourself to something that you know is uncomfortable and you ta- you learn to tolerate it for mm-hmm. as long as you can, it's like that carries with you across all other facets of life. You know, just you're, you're so much more tolerant of discomfort. And so you can sit in it longer, which mm-hmm. is essential to figure out how to do because that's the only way to realize how much our discomfort can teach us mm-hmm. and how much we can learn from it and how we need it as a resource for growth. Um, and so, I, yeah, I like I love 
ideas like that being more at the forefront of how we think about mental health and therapy, mm -hmm. which is another thing that, again, I appreciate about this film is um, I think it'll play a huge part in getting people past a lot of the preconceived notions and stigmas they have toward therapy and start to see it as many more things. So I want to ask you if I can, one, the other thing that the question that I didn't have an answer to, but I just thought was was a question that came up for me throughout, and especially in the beginning, they talk about he talked about how he didn't like not being able to give them something right away, like something to do. These tools came out of that. And Jonah was like, you know, I wish like I go to a therapist and I want advice. I want mm. my friends to just listen and shut up. And I and that's another thing I think as therapists that we struggle with is sometimes we feel helpless. And so we want to give them something mm -hmm. right because we're feeling their helplessness. And yet we also know from decades of research that one of the main values people get from therapy is just being heard and yeah. understood and it's not necessarily you know getting tools and so that's a question that came up for me as I was watching this is I, I talk completely 100% resonate with wanting tools so I just did EMDR training this year right like that's a tool it's structured you know you're giving them something mm -hmm. it's it feels very effective and it's a it's a tool um and where is that line between wanting tools so we don't feel helpless mm -hmm. and also developing that skill of sitting with someone's pain, letting them feel heard and knowing that there's value in just sitting with someone and letting them know that you hear them and, you know, I they think have that, that space. I think that this – so this – question reminds me a lot of our conversation when we had when we talked about like clinical documentation which is next week's episode but um we talked about how when we first started writing DAs when we first started doing this stuff we needed it to be so structured and we started by asking every single question that goes down the line and you you know you just you don't really veer a whole lot and then as you become more comfortable as a therapist you start to kind of figure out what your style is and you don't rely as heavily on the structure you don't rely as heavily on the tools and I think that as someone who hasn't been practicing for very long I am still kind of going back and forth. Like when I first started doing doing therapy, I was I relied so much on tools and relied so much on structure and felt like I needed to have like printouts for clients, yeah. you know, yep. stuff like that. Yep. And then and then as you as I as I did got more comfortable and settled more into my role, I I backed away from those more. And 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 I think now I'm still kind of figuring out what the role of tools and structure mm -hmm. is in sessions and with clients. And I think part of that is personal preference. But um, I yeah, I I do the like the control freak in me or like the anxious mm -hmm. person inside of me likes the idea of having a plan or mm -hmm. having things that are just like these are my fallbacks these are the tools and and something where like if a client says I'm struggling with this I have the tool for that you know when I even get clients who come to me are like so I was talking to my friend and they get they get like homework all the time and why am I not getting homework and I'll say cool I can definitely give you homework I give that to them and what happens they literally never do yeah, it I never I, no I just, one ever does I just sound like you think I got time to grade your homework yeah <laughs> But I give but, them homework. They they did, and then they feel bad. They come back, and now they feel guilty. That's what I also mm -hmm. tell them is um, that they didn't do. I was like, homework. I don't want to put you in a position yeah. where you're going to feel like you disappointed me yeah, by exactly. not doing it. Oh, that's so a good like, answer. That's so, why, and that's that, what that's I say to them. I say really I can don't give you yeah. homework, and I'll tell and I'll say I tell you my experience with this. I give people homework because they ask for it. It can be really worthwhile stuff to do, and then they take it home, and then life happens, and they're busy, and they don't want to do homework, and then they. They're afraid to come back or they come back feeling oh. bad because they didn't do their homework. And to me, that's not therapeutic to, to feel stressed now about coming to therapy because mm -hmm. you didn't do your homework. It's yeah. like when I took piano lessons, <laughs> I hated doing my piano oh, theory my stuff. And it was a stressor every week. Yeah. Oh, God, I've, I I've, I've, I've I helped young women you know, work through the trauma of piano lessons. I, of that when you said that, theory is literally, just, yeah. I was like, I feel yeah. that in my bones, Terry. It's a, it's a, it's a cutthroat industry. And so every time people ask for homework, I think about music theory. Oh, I think about like, yes, and music theory is helpful. And if you want to be a musician, <laughs> it's the stuff you've got to know. So it's not mm -hmm. like, it's not like therapy homework has no value. But I think these tools that we give, I, 
some of it I feel like comes out of our own anxiety to want to give our clients measurable, a measurable product, like something they can that's tangible, that they can feel like yeah. they're getting something for their time and their, sure. their money, and mm -hmm. you know, and 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 I think they want that, but also, and and I, I'm not saying as tools aren't valuable. It's just figuring out when am I giving them something because this is helpful, and how do I make sure that I don't start to rely on these tools at the expense of the value, the true value of sitting with somebody and not trying to solve their problems, not trying to say, well, if you just did this, this will take care of it, you know? Yeah. Great. Yeah. See you next and week. Like, I, I think if I had to take a guess of how that plays out, like in Phil's work, because the notions that inform his tools are so like deeply philosophical and nuanced mm -hmm. and complex, um, I would imagine it's more of like, uh, all right, so like for this tool, it's like here is what this tool can do as a concept and like mm -hmm. figure out how to actually make this tool, you know, like in a way that'll work for you. You know, it's so like each person, you know, to kind of bring their own meaning to how that tool actually comes to life for them, yeah. I would imagine looks different. Mm -hmm. Or or like I, maybe I'm saying that's also a way you can go about not falling into that trap you're talking about because a lot of people's therapy can become almost like orthodox. You know, where it's mm -hmm. like, this is what you do. This will get you from point A, point a to point B. Here's your thought record. Yeah. This is yeah. how you get better. Um, and yeah. they don't deviate from that. You know, that's garbage therapy. That's just totally uncreative and is not going to keep your clients compelled, you know, to, to stay engaged. Um, so, yeah, like it's, it's who knows what Phil looks like with other clients. Yeah. Um, but one of the things, you know, when we were talking about uh, building – people's tolerance up for suffering and the value of just being able to sit with them as opposed to just giving them advice, even when that's what they really want. Um, it made me, brought me back to the year that I did play therapy. You know, and the two big things I learned from that is I, I have no business doing play therapy. <laughs> I was going to say, I've known you for how long? And I did not know that you ever did play therapy. But it was like, it was essentially Uno. Yeah, yeah, we've talked um, about those days. And so, but what I, you know, the the big lesson I took away from that, and I've seen this play out with, and it really helped inform uh, how I approach this as a educator and supervisor, is when you first start doing play therapy, it's like you have to convince yourself that what you're doing is actually therapy, you know, because mm -hmm. like kids will come into your office and you'll play, mm -hmm, you'll yeah. play a, like Candyland. I mm -hmm. played Candyland thousands of times in that elementary school. Um, and you know, then you go bill health partners for <laughs> nine zero eight three seven, mm -hmm. uh, and you're, you're like, this is fraud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I just uh, bill the health partners yeah, for playing for Uno. playing Uno. <laughs> uh, and but when you stick with it and you start to experience the power of what that creates, which <laughs> is a security, a secure relationship, mm -hmm. like you're you're creating a safe environment. For them to just exist however they want to exist it's like you're not pushing them in any direction you're not influencing anything you don't have any expectations for them mm -hmm. you know it's like they just get to show up and just let whatever needs to ooze out of them ooze out of them and while practicing taking turns well yeah <laughs> in <laughs> and play losing. therapy um <laughs> how to lose sometimes with with grown-ups too you know we need to learn how to take turns you know and so it's like that's that's what it, that's the therapeutic relationship. And I was just sitting here thinking, could I play Uno with my adult clients? Is totally. that yeah. something we could do? And that's why... I kind of want to do that. You know, you, well, you can do whatever you want. Um, <laughs> you can say whatever you want too, I guess, uh, according to Phil. Whether it's helpful. Whether, <laughs> whether um, Uno's helpful. I mean, we could do it. But. <laughs> yeah, so it's... it's. I think a lot, of, a lot of meaningful lessons, you know, that I kind of took away from this. And I, I, I'm just... I love that it exists. Yeah. I love how it came to life. I mm -hmm. love how it evolved. I love how the final product was nothing that reflected the initial storyboard. Mm -hmm. I love the vulnerability of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just, I just loved it. I do think. Thank you, Jonah. That's the and big thank you, lesson: Phil. is you can't grow without being vulnerable. Yeah. You can't mm -hmm. stay in your comfort places. You can't keep the the ugly stuff to yourself and think that you're going to grow mm -hmm. because that's the discomfort that's the pain is is airing the that that hard stuff and yeah that's what's going to keep us stuck and i think that's really what this was about is 
it's it's learning to integrate the painful, messy stuff into your story. And to do that, you probably have to tell it to somebody. Mm-hmm. And what in some a way. what a good way to continue destigmatizing mental mm-hmm. health to show yeah. this is what this looks like. This yep. is how powerful this relationship can be. This is why this is important. And I think a lot of people will find these tools valuable. I think a lot of people, I think a lot of clients will, will see their therapists in a more humanizing way. And I think that they'll also, uh, like realize therapists and clients alike. I hope that they realize like how that relationship is, is beneficial in both ways. Like I think, yeah, this is great film, Jonah and Phil. Yeah. And like, I mean it when I say, like I am deeply and sincerely appreciative of Jonah making this movie. Yeah. Like I think it will play a huge part in everything we're trying to do as a company. Yeah, which is open people up to therapy being something again something much different than than they, they than they preconceived. Um, so shifting back into my corporate executive role, Jonah, do I have the investment opportunity for you? Oh uh, Ellie Mental Health is now p- expanding, franchising, you know, into California. Yeah. Uh, sure. So you just have your people get in touch with my people, and we'll take it from there. Miranda at elliementalhealth.com. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining for this special episode. And we hope that you enjoyed the film as much as we did. And we'll see you back next week for our next episode.